you may remember that when we were talking about Roman history, if you can really call it that at this early point, we left off with king number six, Servius Tullius. He was the one who had been a slave child in the house of king number five, Tarquinius Priscus, and when he magically burned but did not burn, remember Tanaquil refused to put him out when she saw this burning child, it became clear that he was marked for greatness and he was treated pretty much like he was their son. And when Tarquinius Priscus was assassinated by disgruntled relatives of the previous king, Ancus Marcius, Tanaquil basically put Servius on the throne next, keeping their house alive and in power. So we're gonna pick up with a little bit of reading from Livy's history, which is one of the main sources here. We've looked at this a few times. So you'll have the PDF of this that you can follow along with. And for right now, here is a rather less than dramatic reading of the end of Servius's reign. And this is, here we go. So starting at the top of this page, there was no doubt that by this time, Servius had a definite prescriptive right to the throne. Nonetheless, he determined still further to strengthen his position. Young Tarquin was spreading malignant gossip about his never having received the popular vote. Remember that the Romans elect their kings, you don't just inherit it. And Servius was well aware of what he was saying. Accordingly, to conciliate the goodwill of the commons, meaning the everyday people, he first distributed land captured in war amongst private holders, and then took the bold step of demanding the people's vote upon his title to the throne. He was declared king by an overwhelming and unprecedented majority. Essentially, he bribes them first and then asks them to vote to make him king, officially. So, continuing on, Tarquin was undismayed by Servius's success. Indeed, his hopes of gaining the throne burned more hotly than before. One reason for this was that he knew that the distribution of land had been disapproved by the Senate, a fact which would enable him to vilify Servius and increase his own influence in that body. Another was his own character, for who was by nature ambitious, and his wife, Tullia, was not of the sort to let his ambitions sleep. In ancient Greece, more than one royal house was guilty of crime, which became the stuff of tragedy. Now Rome was to follow the same path, but not in vain, for that very guilt was to hasten the coming of liberty and the hatred of kings, and to ensure that the throne it won should never again be occupied. Tarquin, or Lucius Tarquinius, son or grandson, more probably the former, of Tarquinius Priscus, had a brother called Aarons, a mild-mannered young man. The two brothers, as I mentioned before, had married Servius's daughters, both of them named Talia, but in character diametrically opposed to each other. Notice they're both named Talia because Roman women just got the name of the family. You don't get a first name. If you were the elder one, you might be called Talia Maior, and the younger one would be Talia Minor. Maior is related to our English word major. It can mean bigger, but in this sense, it's not that one of them is just larger than the other, though that might happen based on age. It's used to mean elder, and minor is smaller, or in this case, the younger. So women don't even get full public names because they're not really supposed to be out, of, out and about doing stuff in public and government and society. So they don't need anything other than their family name. It's one of the ways that it's really not pleasant to be a woman in the ancient world. So anyway, you have two Tullias and you have um, Lucius and Aaron's Tarquinius here. So the two brothers marry the two sisters, but the two sisters are sort of opposites and the brothers are as well. We're gonna get a bit of a mismatch at first though. Returning to the reading. By what I cannot feel was the luck of Rome. It so happened that the two fiercely ambitious ones Tarquin and the younger Talia did not in the first instance become man and wife, for Rome was thereby granted a period of reprieve. Few. Servius's reign lasted a few years longer and Roman civilization was able to advance. The younger Talia was bitterly humiliated by the weakness of her husband, Aaron's, and fiercely resented his lack of ambition and fire. It was to Tarquin that the whole passion of her nature turned. Tarquin was her hero. Tarquin, her ideal of a true man and true prince. 
Her sister she despised for failing to support with a woman's courage the husband she did not deserve. There is a magnetic power in evil. Like draws towards like. And so it was with Tarquin and the young Talia. It was the woman who took the first step along the road of crime. Whispers passed between her and her sister's husband. Their secret meetings grew more frequent, their talk less guarded. Soon she was pouring into his ears the frankest abuse of her sister and Aaron's, while Tarquin, though one was his brother and the other his brother's wife, let her talk on. You and I, she said, would have been better single than bound in marriage so incongruous and absurd where each of us is forced by a cowardly partner to fritter our lives away in hopeless inactivity. Ah, if God had but given me the husband I deserve, I should soon see my own house that royalty, which now I see in my father's. The bold words struck an answering fire. Two deaths soon followed, one close upon the other, and Tarquin found himself a widower, Tullia a widow. The guilty pair, then married, the king not preventing, but hardly approving the match. So they basically get rid of their spouses and seems a bit suspicious. From that day onward, Servius, now an old man, lived in ever increasing danger. His wicked daughter soon found that one crime must lead to another, lest the two murderers should have proved to have been committed in vain she gave her husband no rest by day or night. Did I want a man, she urged, simply that I might call him husband, simply to endure slavery with him in silence? No, I wanted a man who knew he was worthy of a crown, who remembered that his father was a king, who would sooner reign now than languish in hope. If you are indeed the man I think I married, I salute you as my husband and my king. If not, it had been better for me to stay as I was than to marry not a criminal only, but a coward. Come, do your work. You are no stranger as your father was from Corinth or Tarquinii. No need for you to struggle for a foreign throne. It is yours already. The guardian gods of your hearth and your home proclaim you king. Your father's bust, his palace, his royal seat, his name and yours. And these is your title. You dare not then why continue to play the cheat? Why let men look on you as a prince? It were better to slink back to Tarquinii or Corinth, like your brother, not your father. Better to be humble again, as your ancestors were humble long ago. His wife's taunts pricked young Tarquin to action. To Tullia, the thought of Tanaquil's success was torture. She was determined to emulate it. If Tanaquil, a foreigner, had had influence enough twice in succession to confer the crown, first on her husband, then on her son-in-law, it was intolerable to feel that she herself, a princess of the blood, should count for nothing in the making or unmaking of kings. Tarquin could not stand against her maniacal ambition. Soon, he was about his business, in and out of the houses of the patrician families, the lesser families especially. He began to solicit their support, he reminded them of the favors his father had done them and urged them to show their gratitude. To the younger men, he offered money as a bait. He vilified Servius and promised heaven on earth should he succeed. Support for him increased. Everywhere his influence grew until at last, when he judged the moment had come, he forced his way with an armed guard into the forum. It was like a bolt from the blue, but worse was to come. Taking a seat on the king's chair in front of the Senate house, he ordered a crier to summon the senators to appear before King Tarquin. They came immediately, some by prearrangement, others because they dared not keep away for fear of the consequences. All were profoundly shaken by su the sudden and extraordinary turn of events and convinced that Servius was doomed. Before the assembled senators, Tarquin proceeded to blacken the king's name and pour contempt upon his origin. He was a slave and the son of a slave. After his father's shameful death, he had usurped the throne. The customary interregnum, that's the period between the rules of kings, usually when the Romans elect a king rather than just have one declare himself, had been ignored. No election had been held, not the people's vote duly ratified by the Senate, but a woman's gift had put the scepter in his hands. Base-born himself and basely crowned, he had made friends with the riffraff of the gutter, 
where he belonged. Hating the nobility to which he could not aspire, he had robbed the rich of their property and given it to vagabonds. All the burdens once shared by the community at large, he had laid upon the shoulders of the wealthy and distinguished. The sole object of the census had been to make rich men's fortunes known and therefore envied when it was not to plunder them for presents to the poor. While Tarquin was still speaking, a report got through to Servius, who in anger and alarm at once hurried to the scene. Standing in the forecourt of the Curia, that's the Senate house, he loudly interrupted the speaker. Tarquin, he cried, what is the meaning of this? How have you dared while I live to summon the Senate and sit in my chair? The chair is my father's, was the insolent reply. A king's son is better heir to the throne than a slave. We have let you mock and insult your masters long enough. Confusion followed. Some roared for Tarquin, some for Servius. The mob rushed the Senate house. A struggle was imminent, and it was clear that possession of the throne would depend upon the issue. Tarquin had gone too far to turn back, and it was now all or nothing for him. Young and vigorous as he was, he seized the aged Servius, carrying him bodily from the house and flung him down the steps into the street. Then he returned to quell the senators. The king's servants and retinue fled. While he himself was making his way, half stunned and unattended to the palace, he was caught and killed by Tarquin's assassins. And we have a scene of this that you might remember from the slideshow, depending on where we got to. Here is poor Servius being thrown down because this is the comic history of Rome made for British school children in the 1880s or 90s. This guy has glasses and these guys, remember, look like maybe recognizable politicians of the day, including this guy whose head looks kind of like a giant log. I really want to know who that is. You have a stoic British fellow tweaking another person's nose. Servius looks a bit like Humpty Dumpty. Tarquin has a rather sinister mustache. And all in all, it, I guess it's funny, kind of strange. Notice these, the Foskis here, the rods and axes that are the symbol of power. And this looks more like a more modern Roman legionary after the Marian reforms and whatnot, so hundreds of years later, but yeah, why be accurate? So going back to the reading, if it will, there we go. Here we are. It is thought that the deed was done at Tullia's suggestion, and such a crime was not at least inconsistent with her character. All agree that she drove into the forum in an open carriage in a most brazen manner, and calling her husband from the Senate house was the first to hail him as king. Tarquin told her to go home, as the crowd might be dangerous. So she started off and at the top of Cypress Street, not our Cyprus, where the shrine of Diana stood until recently, her driver was turning to the right to climb the Erbian Hill on the way to the Esquiline when he pulled up short in sudden terror and pointed to Servius's body lying mutilated on the road. There followed an act of bestial inhumanity. History preserves the memory and the name of the street, the street of crime. The story goes that the crazed woman, driven to frenzy by the avenging ghosts of her sister and husband, think about that for a moment, drove the carriage over her father's body. Blood from the corpse stained her clothes and spattered the carriage so that a grim relic of the murdered man was brought by those gory wheels to the house where she and her husband lived. The guardian gods of that house did not forget. They were to see to it in their anger at the bad beginning of the reign that as bad an end should follow. The reign of Servius Tullius lasted 44 years. It was a good reign, and even the best and most moderate successor would not easily have emulated it. One of the most notable marks was the fact that with Servius, true kingship came to an end. Never again was a Roman king to rule in accordance with humanity and justice. Nevertheless, however mild and moderate his rule, he intended, according to some writers, to abdicate in favor of a Republican government, simply because he disapproved in principle of monarchy, but treachery within his family circle prevented him from carrying his purpose into effect. So we're gonna end the reading part here we will look at more of this later with Serbia, sorry, Tarquinius Superbus and find out what exactly Livy thinks about this last king, if it's not already clear. But I want you to think about 
and we don't have to write anything yet. We've got a lot going on. But I want you to think about who is the driving force here and what the sort of various roles that Tarquin and Tullia play in this. Why is it that we see as much of the king who kills his successor as we do of his wife? And what do you think Livy, our historian here, is trying to indicate by this? Where, how would you rate their crimes or compare them? So we will talk more about this relatively soon. And we'll pick up with the last Tarquin, but I wanted to give you something to look at here in terms of the end of Servius, connect back to what we've done before, and 